Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rakuten booth at MWC Barcelona 2024. I'm now delighted to introduce our next session of the day, which is going to cover the ways that Rakuten Group is using artificial intelligence to transform telecom operations and its wider ecosystem. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Rakuten's Chief Data Officer, Ting Kai. Please give Ting a round of applause, ladies and gents our first panelist of today. Please also give a round of applause to Rahul Atri, the president of OSS for Rakuten Symphony. Madhu Medith, the chief data and AI officer for Rakuten Mobile. And our moderator for today's session, Robert Curran from Appledore. Thank you very much, ladies and gents. I'll hand over to you, Robert. Thanks. Thanks very much. Hope you can hear me okay. Uh, real pleasure to be here today. Nice to see people back at NWC. Busy, busy show. We have a really interesting panel today. Uh, it's a fascinating collection of three people working with the same company, but actually three very different companies. Uh, we have an kind of e-commerce company, digital company, uh, a mobile company, mobile operator, uh, and then the, the enabler of all of that, the ecosystem and, and software company. Um, so it's a great, great pleasure to do that. And that represents something that telcos are kind of aspiring to do in many ways. You know, we're talking about digital service providers you know, CSPs becoming DSPs, telcos, techos, it's, it's all around us here. But it's a great opportunity to find out from a group of companies that are actually executing on that today. So I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Uh, we are talking about AI, um, but it's as much as it's about AI and telecom, it's about what AI and telecom enables in other group companies, which again is a great, great perspective to have. Uh, Ting, I, I'm going to start with you uh, today, partly because you're closest. Uh, but also partly because you've got a very interesting background. Um, prior to joining Rakuten, you had a long experience in, in the content and search area. So uh, in your role as a chief data officer, how does that background kind of shape your vision for, for what you're seeing at a, at a Rakuten group level? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a very exciting to be here to see everyone at the M Mobile World Congress. And this is actually a combination of two of my, two of my favorite topics. Uh, internet connectivity and AI. So my, uh, I spent many years at Google and Microsoft and I learned a lot and really grateful for all the people I work with at Google and uh, Microsoft. And my career actually started with uh, networking. So, uh, you know, when I uh, moved to US uh, to attend college, at that time, the telephone calls is like a $3 a minute. It was so expensive. And at, at college, I'm mostly interested in networking and I joined a networking startup. Um, Bay Networks and Terabee Networks, and I joined Microsoft because Windows NT at that time wanted to become the router of the internet. Uh, so that's how I, I, I started. But most I learned uh, from Microsoft and Google is, uh, is the search experience, where we apply a lot of the AI and machine learning into search uh, ranking, and, and how we do AI and machine learning at scale. You know, every day there's a billions of uh, search queries coming in. How do we leverage all those machine learning and AI technology to quickly understand the user intent and put the most important results at the top? So uh, that experience helped me greatly. And today I'm with Rakuten. And I have to say, this is the best company to work. You know, despite all the company I have worked with, uh, Startup and Microsoft and Google. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, my Rakuten offers a lot of variety and adventure. And I couldn't pass the opportunity to work with our founder and Mickey. You know, it's such a delightful experience. Uh, we are actively hiring in Europe, so you are welcome to apply. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, great uh, recruitment uh, advertisement there. But uh, your your energy is uh, in, infectious. Uh, Madhu, I'd like to bring it closer to home in the context of of this event. Uh, Rakuten Mobile is obviously where some of this comes together. Um, I, I'm interested in in exploring. Obviously, you've been through a huge build phase in the last few years. Mickey's presented, I think anybody who's seen any of the earnings calls has a clear idea of the, the sort of phases that you've gone through and the phase that you're now in. Could you talk about some of the practical applications of AI uh, in those early phases and, and what you're doing today in, in, in sort of operational uh, areas people might recognize? Yeah, yeah. So before that, I would like to uh, uh, describe about like, uh, as I started my 70% of my career towards uh, standards, mainly working in companies like Qualcomm and other product companies like. So where I see that, you know, how the you know, product should work in the real environment. But when I move into Rakuten uh, from last four years, what I'm seeing is what a user is experiencing. 
So what development of the product is different and what user is experiencing is different. So when we started this, uh, this organization, we know that Rakuten is pioneer in ORAN uh, technology and where we have implemented all our stacks in virtualized network and as well as containerized network. We started capturing the data, not as in uh, minutes prospect we started capturing the milliseconds prospect So we wanted to identify how a user is experiencing our network in milliseconds prospect That's where your efficiency will come into picture. The, what you learn from the standards and the, what you're giving in the experience is what AI is actually transforming over there. So now coming to the applications, we have a lot of applications which we built across, uh, coming like, you know, a million dollar application, RET, compensation algorithm, impact analysis. So these are the applications which we built with respect to the, what we learned from the standards. So user experience versus actual the product is totally two different segments. We are connecting these two dots with respect to the actual valuable data points. So now, we to, to make this entire system, it took around close to a couple of years for me. We started capturing the data, and we built our in-house database, we built our data lake, we built our own AI platform, which is actually running up and running for more than, uh, you know, 24 by 7, to be honest. That's how the stability and how the scalability happening in both vertical and horizontal in our network today. So this is totally different experience for me when I see how a user's experience our data packets in the network uh, than a standard when I go over there. Yeah. And, and in your context, uh, you're looking not just not just at network data, but the experience of other uh, digital service applications on on top of that. Is that is that right? Absolutely correct. Yeah. Okay. Joining joining all the dots then and combining all that information together to do something useful. Uh, Raul certainly takes me into into your area. Uh, you, you've been instrumental in in building the systems, and now as head of OSS at at, at Symphony. Uh, taking that that knowledge and taking that out uh, out to the world, can you just explain maybe some of the key principles and the, the technology uh, at, at an OSS and operations level? Sure. Uh, as Ting was saying, and Madhu also touched on the point, very important for us. Uh, we have the ecosystem, so we know what customers are using the applications, are banking, e-commerce, or even the content. We know how they're using the network. So when we connect all the dots, it's very easy to understand that the network is performing X the user experience is Y, and then you can obviously play around the configurations on, on top of it. Uh, Symphony has been always special because we have the mothership Rakuten Mobile. We know how the network lifecycle is, what problems the operator faces, not in terms of AI, but also in terms of lifecycle from plan, build, operate. And our applications are very specific to your use cases. But we believe um, we need to have some measurable outcomes. People talk about AI all the time, but what are we achieving out of it? What is the ROI? What is the efficiency? And how you are evolving your organization to be AI native? I think that's what we specialize in. And uh, having Rakuten Mobile as the first customer and the sandbox, and having the ecosystem technology what Ting talked about is very easily uh, integrable, and we are taking that to global. Some of the models which Rakuten has produced for various ecosystem companies, whether it is customer experience, whether it is chatbots, whether it is even the image recognition models, we tested with Madhu on Rakuten mobile uh, site inspection, for example, the same image recognition model. We can even figure out what the angle of tilt of the talk is for the screw bolts in the uh, sites right now. We can say, take the same customer experience models and convert that to our operation models in telecom. So having this connecting the dot, having all three pillars of the Rakuten ecosystem together helps Symphony a lot. And I think that's the value we take to our customers. So, so some of those examples, like you say, image recognition is image recognition, but, but if you're doing it in an industrial context, uh, a lot of it is the same at the technology level as you're doing it in a retail context or a, or a mobile context. Exactly the point. Yeah. Right? I mean, AI is AI. Yeah. It's more of culture. Yeah. Uh, the AI model is exactly the same. Why do you waste uh, a lot of learning and a lot of infrastructure when we talk about sustainable networks? So I think that's what Rakuten believes in and always comes with. Symphony, as I said, is special enough uh, that we have hardened the models for our ecosystem. Millions of customers are using it. We have a network mobile network which is running in Japan with millions of subscribers and the end results to prove. We, we don't talk about the buzzwords, but we have real numbers to show the efficiencies. Yeah, yeah. And all that, all that knowledge from you know, 10 plus years as a major e-commerce company, you understand about data and you understand about you know, technology and how to process it. Can, can you talk a little bit more about this this, this is data question, because I'm, I'm interested. Telcos often think they have a lot of, of data, but, but you've got a lot of additional data as well. I mean, how does that shape the, the architecture and the vision and your approach when you sit to, to design new applications or new functions? How does that scale question affect how you're going to manage the architecture? 
the answer to that is i think a uh, lot of our time in telcos have always been about how i think with ai how is getting easier okay. the challenge for uh, for rakuten and every telco is what what do they want to do what is the future of connectivity what is the future customer what are the services they want to use and i think that's what we are able to solve with ecosystem data with mobile data we can correlate and actually help our customer to have more better experience not in network but also the services we know where they are what kind of services they're using and what their experience is yeah. so you're talking about not only the customer as mobile customer but you're talking about the customer as an ecosystem customer okay. you know their experience end to end you can solve their problems you can be proactive to reach out and that's the kind of value we we are yeah. solving yeah. in in terms of day to day actions in network optimization and the customer experience yeah yeah and i think that's absolutely the point and i did on top please do please do <laughs> yeah i just want to build on, on top of rocket's point on ecosystem actually I, i think ai is a great opportunity for telcos to move beyond operating a dumb pipe uh, so you know when at rocket and group we look at all the things that our member needs and provide services to anywhere we see opportunity to bring additional value whether it's e-commerce or fintech and the mobile you know banking and the golf course the medical you know the ecosystem is so wide we look at everything that user need then provide the services to them and speaking of ai one fundamental challenge one fundamental change is that ai is becoming generative ai and the underlying difference is that ai model the way we build ai model is moving from building specific model for specific task to universal approach that's the fundamental shift you know open ai did a breakthrough by building a large language model now everyone realize hey this is possible to build one large language model and made it universally applicable you know in the customer support area we used to say program very prescriptive dialogue right but it's very limited very restrictive now we have the language model that can understand the general intent you know the model can understand human language all kinds of languages it can understand the code and it can also also so easily understand network logs imagine what it can do for telcos with all the ecosystem service uh, capability and we can enable telcos to move up the value chain beyond operating the network offer value added service such as marketing advertising search you know connecting customers with the service we provide that's a great opportunity for leveraging ai monetizing the assets absolutely I, again it's it's interesting around uh, around the industry there's there's two quite distinct discussions about ai and most of the discussion is on the operational side the cost reduction side you're you're looking at another area here which is all the upside how can i use this to make to make money uh, which is obviously incredibly important for telcos um thing you you mentioned you mentioned the ecosystem word the e word uh and thing you touched on it once open ai uh, can you just talk about the relationship with open ai and and, and any other kind of significant players in the in the rakuten ecosystem yeah of course uh you know at rakuten we want to partner with world's best player to provide the best services to our customers and business partners and we look at open ai we work also work with google and amazon and oracle many service providers and with we want to pick the best tool right so our customers can have the best technology in their arsenal to make them successful open ai is is special in all these relationships in the sense that because they are also very ambitious and we share kind of the same similar value rakuten was founded uh, based on the principle of creating value through entrepreneurship and uh, innovation and both miki and sam are founders and they know each other for many years and we also connected in many uh, many layers many many different ways from product engineering you know it's not a simple software licensing or service licensing kind of relationship we brainstorm ideas together product business model so we explore mutually beneficial economic opportunities uh, so since uh, our announcement at the optimism conference last year we have been experimenting a variety of uh, ideas you know including uh, improving the customer service for our cotton mobile you know just simply replacing like lici- licensing commercial customer so- support software with in-house tools with more language capability just licensing cost alone is hundreds of millions of japanese yen right and not mentioning the additional service improvement that we can provide to customers that's just one example of leveraging ai so with the reason announcement we are further our collaboration 
in the sense that we're, we're looking at additional opportunity, whether it is a fine tuning or continue the pre-training or building custom model, you know, we are looking at all options to deliver co cost effective solutions to our customers. Comprehensive relationship then and, and very collaborative again, it's one of the key words in our industry right now. Uh, I, I love the experimentation idea there. This isn't just a straight, okay, we, we partner with the license and then, then we move on. It's much more sophisticated and nuanced than that. I think. Madhu, I, I want to take things down to the front line of this because one of the key questions that telcos often had is, is about adoption of AI and getting users to adopt and, and, and the role of humans in this process. Uh, on the front line of AI, can you talk a bit about how you've had brought people on board to, to use AI directly, indirectly, and what the response has been like to that, and how do you manage that process? Got it. So uh, before getting into that, let's say, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like we have, we we built data platform, AI platform from scratch, which is completely in-house. So the meaning is we are storing around petabytes of data. Today I have more than 25 petabytes of data for the last four years. We're having data storing close to three years right now because we are doing all the models from the scratch. We keep optimizing ourselves. Our models are running every 10 minutes prospect. So uh, it's not only limited to the uh, one segment of people in the organization, like AI people or ML people or automation, but what we want to deliver is, uh, deliver is intelligent automation, which has to be spread across the Rakuten mobile as well as the Rakuten ecosystem. Let's say I will give you a few examples. Like we started working with our C uh, ecosystem data, like Rakuten having sounded to organization altogether. We're using our ecosystem data, and as Rahul already mentioned, and things are already mentioned. So we trying to see the, what are the uh, parameters, what are the uh, frequencies where we can fine tune, not only on the operations prospect to as subscriber profiling aspect as well. So we are doing subscriber profiling. We are also looking for the churn, not only with respect to the mobile as well as ecosystem. So yesterday it has been mentioned that our churn rate has been decreased from 4% to 1.4%. So still there is a good scope to reduce the churn from 1.4% to less than, I mean, 0.5% or something like which we want to get it down. So we are still drilling it down to lowest level from a uh, uh, minute level with respect to the, the lowest where we can have a, a cluster where we can see a subscriber why they're churning. Is it, is it because of the quality or because of the ecosystem products or what, what exactly it is? That how we're trying to correlate the data. So now to do all these things, we wanted to ionization with respect to the entire group of companies. So our employees are getting trained with respect to AI. That's what we are uh, transforming slowly from step by step onwards. That's what we have started as ionization. So yes, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know, individual frontline employees, are they, are they conscious of using AI or are, is it sit alongside them as a tool or uh, what's their experience like? So basically, we are giving uh, continuous uh, sessions and continuous learning, which we are doing ourselves. At the same time, we are also training our co employees as well yeah. and the Rakuten ecosystem at a uh, group of companies. So yeah, we are continuous learning. It's not, AI is not, you know, something like which we can learn and we can stop for them. We have to keep learning every day. As I mentioned, we keep training our models the same way we have to keep upgrade ourselves. So that's how we are actually uh, going in our, in our organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it makes sense. And it, it's, again, a, a, a continuous change. I like this term you use, AI-nization. AI AI-nization, <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. You head around uh, uh, right. so, well, For us, uh, Rob, one thing was easy. I think for most of the organization, data becomes the problem. Data yeah. are always siloed for all the organization, different okay. part of the ecosystem, right? For us, like Madhu said, the data was never a problem. Yeah. We always had one common data lake where all the data from network customers, BSS, OSS, all comes together yeah. and then obviously the power of ecosystem on top of it we made sure that the culture is to build data products and the data products are exposed to the users to build their own use cases right so adaption is easier because you don't have the boundaries of organization dividing the boundaries of data as well and then everyone gets exposed them as a product and build their own use cases uh, funny enough but uh, strange enough in fact in rakuten we don't see the pushback on here people are more adaptive they want to grow, and I think this comes as a culture from the top. Yeah. And that's why the term ionization is super important because it's the DNA of Rakuten, like the automation was, like the other incent, uh, initiatives with the leadership did. Yeah. Uh, let, let me add a couple of points. I think uh, both Rahul and uh, Madhu mentioned data. Actually, one thing I found fortunate at Rakuten is from the founding of Rakuten, we, almost all the services are united under one Rakuten ID. Uh, in other company, I have done a lot of projects just to merge the data 
a merged ID, you know, I was very, very really fortunate that, hey, uh, the founder of Rakuten had the vision of having one ID and all the common data source. So speaking of AI-nization, uh, Rakuten actually did a similar project called english -nization. You know, think about a Japanese company and uh, standardize English as a common language. That's just uh, tremendous. I, I feel like it's even a bigger challenge than AI-nization. Uh, I think one key thing of overall AI-nization strategy is we want to augment human creativity with the power of AI. You know, when you roll the AI, naturally people ha have the concern, is this going to replace my job? And no, I, I, think, I think we want to enable you to do more. And all of our you know, like e-commerce agents, you know, Rakuten mobile shops, and they can do a lot more to kind of promote all of the ecosystem services beyond the Rakuten mobile, beyond insurance, or beyond you know, travel, right? So this is how we can enable people to do more with AI. Ask me about the Englishization. <laughs> it was so easy for me to just come from India, land in Japan, and start working from day zero. Right. Because everyone could just interact in English. Yeah, I think without Englishization, none of us would be possible no. working yeah. at Rakuten, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then uh, on the other part, Rakuten ID. So we already have the primary key, right? Okay. Every okay. customer is tagged with one customer ID. Doesn't matter which ecosystem application service they're using. Doesn't matter how they come into the ecosystem, they're discoverable. And the data... Uh, insights are available for all these systems. Yeah, that, that's such a key thing. I, I've been involved in various projects in telco to, to try to understand, like, who is the customer? And it's 15 different things. So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And maybe uh, one more point, if I may add okay. on the data. I think Rakuten mobile team really did the fundamental breakthrough of virtualization, of separating software and hardware. That makes it possible to move the data into cloud. And think about data, cloud, plus AI. You know, data and cloud is just prerequisite and perfect setup and in almost uh, like ideal playground for me, for us to apply AI, right? So a uh, great work for, from Rakuten Mobile and Rakuten yeah. Symphony team. So one question I have really for all three of you um, is AI, the, the tools are there, the technology is there, it's so accessible that, that nowadays it can seem it's very easy to start. The barrier to entry uh, from a point of using the, the tool uh, is quite low. But, but how do you, in each of your different areas, evaluate what's going to be worth doing and what's not worth doing? Uh, there are many problems that could be solved by AI, but some, solve, some problems could be solved by guessing. It's a question of what, you know, what, what's, the right, uh, what's the right tool for the job. How, how has the, as I say, the availability of the technology changed how you evaluate, okay, what should we do, what could we do, and what, what can we do? Any, any thoughts on that? Uh, it depends upon the, the data. The data points okay. what you're reading, basically. So. Uh, we need to understand what is an intelligent automation, which we can do as a statistical model, which is immediately which we can do. It doesn't need to AI over there, which we doesn't need ML over there. So which can be done very quickly, some of the use cases. But some of the use cases which, doesn't meet, which we need to explore ourselves, basically from the data. So that's what we do, the unsupervised kind of learning, which we will be coming to know. Because as I mentioned, we have petabytes of data, and we are getting terabytes of data every day. As a human, we cannot able to understand, we cannot able to fix the data points unless you do the uns unsupervised learning yourself. That's what your AI will come into picture. Some of the things which we already know, where we can apply directly, manually we can work, some automation skills will work over there, which we adapted, that's what I'm trying to say. So our platform is capable of intelligent automation where we have uh, some of the applications like saw and all these things, which we can directly change immediately. It doesn't need to train any model. But some of the models which we need to explore the data, which actually takes some time. So the, the point, what I'm trying to say is we need to spend some time to understand the data. Such a huge okay. data which we are using today in the network. And it's not only the mobile data, I'm talking about ecosystem data to derive the equations. So that's what you know, we have to spend some time to understand the equation between uh, quick learning versus uh, supervised learning. Okay. Automation versus AI. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. For, me, for me, it's very easy. Uh, my job is products. Uh, I build products for life. Uh, we call it banking value. Okay. How much banking value I achieve of the use cases, okay. and how do I measure that? Once we are able to measure the banking value, is it return on investment? Is it bringing efficiency? Is it a monetization use case, or does it actually solve a use case in the real sense? Yeah. If we do that, then we start working on the use cases solutions part of it, that how do we solve that? If AI is the solution, for sure. But we focus on a lot of things because I own a development team of 1,300 people. Okay. Uh, it's so easy. Everyone comes to me and say, I want to build this. And yeah. with ANization coming in, okay. becoming the <laughs> main thread in the organization, everyone wants to build a use case, right? <laughs> but we, we focus on a lot of things when we, when we are evaluating those use cases. Yeah. Uh, before even getting into data, before getting into development or anything, 
maybe uh, tomorrow we get into a point where AI is building AI. Yeah. But today we are at a point where we have to build the data products, we have to build the use cases. So we're very focused on measurable outcomes. Yeah. And I think that's been our DNA as well. When we talked about automation, cloud, we want it to be measured. We say 40% efficient of what? Yeah. Well, and in this case as well, we've been talking to a lot of customers. They have been seeing a lot of AI application in the operations part. Yeah. But for us, because the factor is measurement of the efficiency, we have built use cases for planning, we have built use cases for deployment, we have built use cases for, yeah. let's say, healing and, and data use cases as well. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let me uh, add to uh, Madhu and Rahul's point on data and the measurement. So there is definitely a lot of hype uh, out there and there is news about AI every day. So what we do is actually leverage data to do evaluation. You know, there's academic paper, there's news, there's marketing, you know, everybody is talking about AI. But what we do is say, uh, use tw over 25 years of each of our e-commerce data to build evaluation set. In any new paper published, we replicate it in our, we build a deep learning foundation so we can easily uh, replicate open source model in our AI lab. So then we can evaluate you against our own data to see if this model is real, to see if this model is ap applicable, specific to our case. And I'll just give you a concrete example. Uh, we built the Deep Learning Foundation and launched a semantic search uh, for Rakuten Fashion and Rakuten Ijiba. And because we can quickly evaluate a lot of open source model to see, hey, this one works against these transaction data. You know, and one specific thing about the data we have, it's a lot more valuable uh, when you have search data versus click data. You know, I wo worked on web search for many years and uh, all the search engines use click data. But as you can imagine, click data is very noisy. Purchase data is like a gold. So because it's a lot cleaner, you can clearly differentiate, hey, which one is valuable, which one is not. So through evaluation and measurement, we know which model works, then we deploy it uh, with Rakuten, and then we make it available to our partners as well. And, and what it does is when you're searching, you're actually understanding the intent of the customers. Okay. Right? You know what they're searching for, what they're looking for, rather than probably doing a process mining to be very sure. Right? So when you, when you start recording these, you can also build some of the efficiencies which we are working on. Some of the intents are local search. Those are just the vector search in my database rather than going into an open AI model or, okay. Okay. or a, a large language model to do a global search. Yeah. And that's how we are also uh, saving we're also optimizing the customer results and a lot more things. So the, the difference between the search and the click is the intent understanding and you build on that. The tool learns on that and you are recording the intent. And then you can even bucketize that to say, operation guys are asking me these five queries. Yeah. Uh, after the new iPhone launch, uh, customers are coming back and asking these five questions. Yeah. And those are the playbooks which are available to the care agents always. A guy called from iPhone new model, they know that one of the problems would be the solution and yeah. you can finish the call in seconds. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a great point. Uh, I think one of the key benefit of large language model is intent understanding. So similarly with semantic search, we were able to understand what you mean beyond what you say. And for example, I was looking for uh, what shirt shall I wear to go see the fireworks in Tokyo. By the way, if you haven't been to Tokyo, Tokyo has the best fireworks ever. So. Uh, you know, before we implemented the semantic search, uh, we used to return very few results, almost zero results for a long query like this. You know, find the shirt to see a fireworks in Tokyo. But now we have tons of options for our user. The reason is that, you know, semantic search and deep learning and embedding model and vector database can more fundamentally understand what you mean. So in addition, semantic search also providing a critical tool for generative AI. You know, uh, it's, it's not as just using the open source model, but you have to combine it with the real-time inventory, real-time data. And how do you do that? It's through a technique called retrieval augmented generation. And you can connect that with search, and you can retrieve real-time information, and combined with the conversation capability, you can deliver a much more effective user experience. Fascinating, guy. You know, it's right across the board. I, I love the idea that you know, an engineer looking to, to fix something, replace a piece of equipment, is doing the same thing as someone looking for a shirt for a fireworks display. I love that. <laughs> well, the process is, is perhaps the same. And that's why we are able to move really fast in terms of use case realization as well. By the way, uh, fireworks from the office looks great, so visit us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, uh, we we're presenting a very positive, optimistic uh, perspective here, which is great. I, I, I can't let you go without asking a little bit about, about challenges, about obstacles, about things that you faced in the past that have been harder than expected or, or unexpected? Is there anything else you call out? I, I, I will mention 
I mean, you've mentioned that the 49 petabytes of data, which is great in one context, and in another context, it's like, oh my God, there's 49 petabytes of data. What are we going to do with that? Can you can you highlight anything you would, you would point out as a challenge along this journey already? Yeah. So uh, here, uh, there is a typical challenge with respect to the telco operators, with respect to governance and compliance. So using the data is one particular aspect, and how you use the data is another aspect, coming your compliance prospect to. So a lot of you know, um, our engineers or a lot of different portfolios of organization would be asking, you know, we want to do the AI. We want to uh, fine tune uh, the algorithms. But the point here is the crux is the, how are we and uh, adhering to the compliance prospect too? That's a key challenge. And second thing is, how are you doing the data engineering? Because we're using some uh, huge petabytes of data, right? That's what I'm trying to say. So how are you processing that? How is your platform? Availability of the platform. These are all the key challenges. And now, when you talk about operations prospect, especially for the telecom side, we wanted to have our anomalies to be detected in milliseconds prospect, which is, which is quite tough to have in the normal and traditional kind of deployment, when you see other uh, cloud native functions. But especially when you look into the Raguten, where we have our solutions in cloud native, we wanted to have our avail availability four nines, and of course our new target is five nines, yeah. basically. So now, how are you going to achieve that? D get, you know, predicting the anomalies and get, you know, detecting the anomalies, how you take in the closed loop as fast as possible. You know, when you come into the 5G, advanced 5G, everything happens in microseconds. Okay. All right. So to do that, how are we closing the loop? Then we are also adapting the new technologies, which we are talking about the RIC is one of the use cases, like it, which controls into a RAN segment, yeah. which is a delicate part, all right? And second thing is, how are you, exp you know, Optimizing your subscriber experience. That's what we're talking about uh, NWDF, probably. So, so network intelligence controller or NWDF, which we're trying to adapt that. So we have our own challenges with respect to governance and you know data mining and data you know engineering and stuff, and also detecting and predicting the algorithms. And how are you closing the, those those loops in millisecond prospect too? And that's what we're learning, and yeah. that's what we're adapting. Yeah. That's what we keep learning ourselves as well. Okay. Yep. Well, anything. Anything to add? Again, I'm a product guy, maybe too many uh, use cases. <laughs> <laughs> too many uh, use cases. And, and the second part is, uh, I think it's it's really important to understand uh, that AI is not cheap, right? All the data, as you talked about, is not cheap. Keeping the data, maintaining the data is not cheap. And then training the models is not cheap. Uh, and that's where I think the partnership, you see th three of us yeah. sitting together, what we learn in the ecosystem, how we train our model, how we test our yeah. models, how we test those models in a real uh, Rakuten mobile network, yeah. and then how we can take that to global is the key. Yeah. And if you have done it once, it is easily deployable, uh, replicable for other customers as well. Okay. I think that's the power of that's Rakuten, yeah. and that's the power which, which Symphony we bring to the world. Okay. okay. Ting, one, any, anything else you'd like to add on challenges? Yeah, uh, maybe a uh, bit of a modest point uh, on the trip, uh, five nine quality, right? And like uh, I think some of the challenges of turning AI into real applications uh, I, I think it's threefold. So one is reliability. You know, it's uh, probably many of you already have done using AI to do demos, but improve the quality from 30% uh, accuracy to 100% or even five nines has been a tremendous challenge. Right? How do you do that? It's way beyond the just uh, picking the right model or implementing the right model. It's really about software engineering. <laughs> it's like a debugability, testability, and how do you use metrics to measure how do you build the operation of deploying, monitoring, and manage the model in production? So these whole system, like AI system, needs to come together to improve the reliability and achieve five. Absolutely, things and yeah. Right. And the second one is, uh, you know, the safety. How do we ensure privacy, as you alluded to, like a safety on the input, safety on the output? You know, is super super important. And lastly, is all the compliance and regulations, right? How how do we kind of uh, not only monitor but also kind of work with the government to create the right incentive so the AI innovation can continue and also you know we can benefit all the citizens in the society so thank you Good. okay um, I'm gonna give the final two minutes to Raul uh, Raul you're a product guy this isn't just vision this is stuff you're actually doing today uh, I think there's a short video that we've got to illustrate some of the uh, some of the techniques in practice uh, are we lining that up yeah, we could play the video. Yeah, I can walk just to give people an idea what this looks like in, uh, in in practical terms. Can we play the video, please?
This is Rakuten AI. Yeah, this is Rakuten AI, built in partnership with Ting and Madhu, the real use case which is running through in the, in the mobile network in Japan. One of the use cases, this is how it looked like, and we have the measurements yeah. uh, from the day go. So you can, you can talk through the intent. For example, in this case, uh, RF engineer comes back and says, show me the coverage holes in the real network. We're able to predict the coverage and also take the intent to say how to optimize this. And the platform will take care of the use cases. Uh, for some use cases, it can be tilt chain. Some use cases, it could be power. Some use cases, it could be beamforming. But in this case, it says, yeah, we want to change the parameters and we just have to say intent is yes, please go ahead. And the tool will make all the changes. Uh, for example, in this case, it's changing the tilt and the tool is smart enough to measure that is a service affecting change or a non-service affecting change. Non-service affecting go live to the pipeline, get deployed for the, and then you can obviously measure pre-post as well. Yeah. And there are, there are tens of use cases which are running up across uh, energy saving wing one, anomaly detection wing one, the other use cases like live. More than happy to show other use cases which are in our demo later on. Yep, that's, that's terrific. Okay, great, plenty to see. How are we doing for, do we have time for questions? Uh, if there are any questions from the audience, we have three terrific, experienced, knowledgeable people right at the frontiers of what we're talking about across the show. Any questions for them? <laughs> I think they're stunned, stunned into, into silence. That's terrific. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great vision. It's great to see Rack 10 executing and, and pushing the boundaries, you know, on the, on the industry and, and see what you guys are doing. So, uh, yeah, excellent. I think we'll, I think we'll call it a, a day there. Thank you very much, General, for your insights. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir.